it's a pleasure to be back again to speak to you all about the medicine of exercise. And there were a couple things that kind of made me psyched about coming back to Google. A, I take care of a lot of you guys, and you're always just a pleasure to, to be around and to see. Um, B, the ice cream truck was like, dude, I love the ice cream truck. Is that, st is that still here? All right, good. I was like, all right, definitely I'm coming, and I'm coming for the ice cream truck, among other things. Um, so what I'm here to do today is to talk about something which intuitively makes a lot of sense. Um, you guys are great at uh, kind of addressing problems, and I want to talk to you about a problem of the next uh, decade, two decades, and I want you to think about what I'm saying, not only from a medical point of view, but from a policy point of view, because I think what you've done is, you know, given the world the ability to communicate in so many different ways here. Uh, and so I want you to put your brains to the problem I'm going to throw at you today, which is uh, some of the problems we're going to be facing and we're going to be facing in the next uh, 10, 20, 30 years going forward. Um, a couple things um, just about me. Um, I'm going to talk about the medicine of exercise today. I have a website here um, that uh, I have a sign up if you're interested in getting our newsletters on preventive health and they've sent out about four a year. Also, I'm pretty active in Twitter um, and, uh, and send out different information on that. What I'm here to tell you guys and what I'm going to be pushing today is what we call get off your, I guess, couch, we'll say. Get off your couch medicine. Um, you guys are going to help me get this message out on the importance of activity and exercise as a medicine. And it's an interesting kind of paradigm shift. The Exercise Cure is a book which I think uh, really, it was an interesting way to kind of pitch this to the guys. I, I did it with Rodale because you know, I'd done the Home Remedies book was very successful in kind of, all right, I'm a runner and I have a hurt knee and I need to do these exercises to fix my knee. This is a conceptual book about looking and changing the way people think about exercise. I gave a lecture last uh, month at Cornell Med School to the second year med students on exercise. Now you'd think that this being, as I'll go through, a very powerful drug, people would hear about this all the time. In the history, in the 200 plus history, history of Cornell Med School, that was the first lecture they'd ever had on exercise, ever. Uh, as I'll talk about, the whole medical system is, is set up to treat disease and it's very poorly set up to encourage wellness. And so. Uh, number one is, and I want to make sure that nobody in your guys' world is, uh, is this person who is basically so focused on whatever it is they're doing, they're not moving. Uh, and, and the concept here is that across the spectrum of the human condition, there's no more powerful, potent, and effective medicine than exercise. Uh, and so I'm just going to kind of go through relatively quickly some information. This study published this year just a couple months ago in a journal called Circulation from the American Heart Association looking at men uh, greater than 45 years of age, a prospective study, which is the best kind in medicine, looking at the effects of heart failure and what causes that. And not surprisingly, sitting around on your butt all the time and not moving correlates to a much higher incidence of heart failure. So it's not good for your heart, and this is the number one killer in the United States. Now, the concept of movement for activity and for health and for uh, just a better balanced life is nothing new. You know, the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans knew that to be sound in mind and body, those things work together. So the concept of kind of dumb jock, it's not really true, in fact. In fact, people, even from the high school and middle school levels, people who are active and involved in sports have everything from higher self-esteem to higher health profiles as they go into adolescence and young adults. So, you know, basically activity is something that starts young. We do a lot of preventive strengthening classes with kids and, uh, you know, getting kids interested and involved in athletics at a young age, and it correlates to a number of good things as they go forward. So there was a big study published last year in the Journal of American Medical Association called JAMA. And in this study, they looked at the anatomy of the healthcare system. Now, a couple things. Number one, we've more than doubled the money we're spending as a, as a product of GDP. We spend about 18% of our GDP, about $2.7 to $2.8 trillion a year. Just to put that in context, that's more than the GDP of most every country in the world. All right, so it's a lot of money we're spending on healthcare. Um, government funding has increased uh, to about 42% of healthcare costs, about $325 billion of which are spent on prescription medications. And Surprisingly, people think that it's old people that cost the system money, but it's really not. It's overweight people, inactive people cost the system by far the most money. Uh, and it's also young people. So 85% of the medical costs are under 65. Um, and a large majority of that, about 60%, are related to the effects of inactivity, obesity, heart disease, diabetes, etc. cetera. Um, so 65% of that spending cost. So basically, our country needs to move. And as we'll kind of get talking about technology, you guys have been helpful in starting to get different apps and things that kind of encourage and track movement. I want to bring those into the discussion on 
you know, encouraging movement as kind of policy. So we have this healthcare system which throws huge amounts of money at disease treatment. The concept is that basically the worse the medical problem, the more the system pays. So if you're somebody that goes in to see or your parents go see somebody for their heart exam and the doctor says, all right, you should exercise and eat well, you know, that's like a normal office. But if you're put on medication, then somebody in some drug company somewhere in New Jersey is going to make a profit. If you have an echocardiogram or an EKG or a catheterization, the more the things that are done, the more the system is reimbursed, all the way up to open heart surgery. And so the system is basically financially incentivizing disease. And it's for every disease, every problem. Um, and wellness, which makes the most sense that we should be thinking about encouraging, really isn't incentivized in the same way disease is. And so we basically wait until it's broken. Um, and so the concept I've been pushing is getting America to go. Now, this is the United States on the far left-hand side of the graph here. Uh, every other Western country averaged out is in the red. So we're spending more than double every country in the world on healthcare expenditure. So with that, I would think we would have the healthiest country in the world, right? How about 28th in life expectancy? Um, so we're spending more than double everybody. We're ranked 28th in life expectancy, and we're just throwing money at this problem. And even all these different discussions about affordable care, et cetera, are a lot about you know, reducing spending in some way, but they're not about the main issue, in my opinion, which is preventing disease, um, which is what we're really not focusing on. Um, this is the United States in 1985. States reporting less than 10% obesity are in light uh, blue, 10 to 15 are in the darker blue. And let's look what happened, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, now 15 to 19% obesity, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, now greater than 20% obesity, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, greater than 25% obesity, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, greater than 30% obesity, 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009. So basically, if you want to be skinny, move to Colorado is the, is the answer here. <laughs> but we have this kind of growing issue of the health, the cost of inactivity in our society. And as much as I love all the computer-based everythings, you know, it basically is another way where people kind of sit at home and do whatever. So getting people up and moving is a huge piece, I think, of the equation of fixing the problem. So I'm going to talk to you guys about you know, what you can do individually, what you can do as a company, and what I think we can start thinking about as a society to try and, I think, deal with some of these issues as we go forth. So what you can do as an individual is find something you like to do. If you like to bike in a group, bike in a group. If you like to go run in a group, run in a group. If you're somebody that's, listen, I just, I'm so stressed out at my place and I want to go run by myself, that's fine too. Whatever it is that will motivate you, that's what you got to do. So number one is finding a way to do it. And I'm going to talk about New York City as a great place to do that because we have a great opportunity to increase what's called our NEAT profiles here. Now, I think nothing is as helpful as some of the different people I see in my life and take care of. I met a guy yesterday who I'd seen um, about three months before. He had really bad back pain and knee pain, and uh, he'd kind of gotten opinions about getting surgery on different stuff. And I said, listen, you are getting a lot of this problem because you're just completely inactive. And you know, if you want to see somebody's torn meniscus, get an MRI. If you want to see their herniated disc, get an MRI. About, as technology has improved, you know, the quality of pictures, about half of you in this room have a torn meniscus or a herniated disc in your back that you don't even know about and I don't care about because it's not bothering you. But the problem is if you start getting tests, things start showing up and then people get things done based on those findings and it's not good for people. This guy, we just got him working on some strengthening and exercise stuff and he's like, I saw him yesterday, he's doing great. I think that you know, puts a lot of these things in a better context because somebody like that that shows up at a psychiatrist's office is probably going to be put on some kind of antidepressant medication and a cardiologist's office some kind of blood pressure medication or cholesterol lowering medication. And there's a lot of medicines. I mean, we live in this society where if you're having sleep problems, you know, your immediate thought is open the window and that butterfly is going to fly and land on your head and you're going to have the best night's sleep of your life. Or you know, like if you're having erectile dysfunction, you just take this medicine, you can throw the football through the tire and like life is great and life is perfect. <laughs> the problem is these medicines cost a lot of money. They have a lot of side effects and, you know, they're often not the best first line treatment. So getting doctors and healthcare professionals to start thinking about prescribing exercise is a big part of the mission of what I'm kind of after with this. And it's interesting, as I mentioned, there's not a lot of movement, there hasn't been a lot of movement traditionally in that direction. 
um, despite the fact that we have great evidence on the role of exercise in, for a number of different problems. So what I've tried to do in Exercise Cure is start with the brain and go down and look, all right, what's the best study for depression and exercise? There's a big study done in Norway where they took one group of people in a prospective study and they looked at uh, their symptoms of mild to moderate depression with exercise versus drugs, and the exercise guys did better. Uh, they looked, you know, so things like anxiety, sleep problems, self-esteem, memory. Exercise is the only drug which works for Alzheimer's and dementia, the only drug, despite this billions of dollars that have been put towards research, it's the only drug that works. So I think there's a lot of information that needs to kind of get out on this, and part of that is it definitely starts with the healthcare profession. And so trying to get uh, physicians and nurses and nurse practitioners to start thinking about prescribing exercise as part of what they do, and trying to get wellness programs to move outside of the realm of companies, which are great, and kind of into the realm of insurance companies, um, incentivizing, as I'll talk about in a second, is something which I think is part of the policy discussion, which I think really definitely needs to happen. Uh, unfortunately, less than a third of doctors talk to their patients about exercise, and those who do don't really know how to do it. So in the second half of Exercise Cure, I've talked about how to set up fitness programs at home for yourselves. Uh, and that's important for docs because they just say, right, exercise a half hour a day. Well, all right, that sounds good. Like, what do I do? How do I do that? Uh, that's been a neat space with some of the different great new apps about setting up programs, by the way, too, which I love, and that's exciting as well. Nutrition. Um, nutrition is part of the deal. So I have in both my books some information at the back on nutrition. I'm more about exercise. I think the data on exercise is far more compelling than it is straight on nutrition. So I think what you eat makes a difference for sure, but after this talk, you are gonna see me hit the ice cream cart, for sure. And I'm gonna do that because I worked out this morning and I like ice cream. Um, so I'm not, a, I'm not an absolutist when it comes to, I'm an absolutist when it comes to exercise, I'm not an absolutist when it comes to food. I feel like you can drive yourself nuts with food, um, and many people do. And I think to me, the health benefits, by the way, of exercise, trump mild to moderate obesity. I'd much rather you be mild to moderately overweight and exercising every day than super skinny and not exercising at all. So I think you know the concept what drug works for everything from kind of some of the brain issues I talked about, reduction in the frequency of the common cold, reduction of blood pressure, reduction of cholesterol levels, uh, treatment of diabetes, uh, treatment uh, and prevention of osteoarthritis and osteoporosis, even certain types of cancer, particularly colon cancer, which is about 40% uh, less common in people who exercise four to five times a day a week, um, is exercise. So this is definitely a medicine. Um, and you can think about it in everything from the kind of life people live to the duration of life people live. Um, every hour you put in of exercise, and because you exercise, you live longer, correlates to uh, about five and a half hours of um, life expectancy if you're going vigorous. By the way, I'm a big fan of vigorous activity. So if you have a half hour, and uh, I talk about the different zones of exertion. Zone one is when, when I'm in right now, just kind of talking, and you could exercise and walk. Zone two is when it's like a little bit uncomfortable. And zone three is when you're huffing and puffing, like Sunday, you'll be in zone three some. Um, you'll be in zone three some Sunday. So um, I want people to be for their work, it's about 25% in zone three, 25% in zone two, and 50% in zone one. So if you're just going for a slow jog, that's great, or a slow walk, that's fine. But try and push your zones up uh, for at least a quarter of every workout up to zone three if you can. Not only does it help perfuse your organs like your brain, et cetera, uh, it is generally much better for your heart muscle, which is also a muscle that needs to be exercised. Um, and now women, since women live longer, you know, exercise has very favorable, but again, it's the intensity which is a big piece of this in terms of looking at what that means. Uh, this was a big study that was published uh, this past year in the British Medical Journal and got a lot of play in the media. It actually came out the week before my book came out in December, which was, I didn't even know, but I was like, wow, that was good luck. Um, and what these guys did is they looked at basically 16 meta-analyses, four on exercise and 12 on drug trials, looking at four conditions, prevention of coronary artery disease, prevention of diabetes, rehabilitation of stroke, and treatment of heart failure. And they compared exercise to drugs. All right, straight comparisons, exercise to drugs. What they found was in about uh, almost 400,000 participants, there was no difference in exercise versus drug groups in the prevention of heart disease and diabetes. What that means that all these people that kind of go to their doctor, all right, go take you know, Crestor, or Lipitor, or whatever it is, um, as part of what you're doing in a preventive way, exercise was just as effective with much less cost and much less side effect. I see you know, every week two or three people in my office coming in with you know, Lipitor or Crestor-induced myalgia. Their muscles are super sore, their joints get achy because of these medicines. There is no such thing as a perfectly safe drug. Even the Tylenol you get at CVS or the Advil you get you know, at the, the bodega around the corner has a side effect. 
Now, normally that doesn't cause a problem, but there's no such thing as a perfectly safe drug. The only drug basically with no side effects is, is this one. It was more effective than medicine in the treatment of smoke, uh, stroke, but was less effective than exercise, than drugs in the treatment of heart failure. So I'm not anti-Western medicine. I'm pro getting doctors and health professionals to start thinking about this as part of the paradigm of what they do when they see, see people. Now, part of what I do is to keep people from doing stupid things. So if you show up in my office, you're like, I'm on the Google running team, which is a great group. Um, I'm gonna run the marathon, but it's two months away and I've not done anything. Uh, I'm like, dude, that's not a very good idea. So, you know, part of what I do is encouraging people to do smart things in a, in a smart way. And I see some of you recognize yourselves in that comment. Um, so looking at the CDC here, the CDC did a big all-cause morbidity study in 2000 looking at what gets people sick and ill. And people think, all right, it's just my genetics. Genetics were about 20% of their conclusion. Uh, the biggest factor was basically exercise, smoking, and diet, which are the big factors which seem to affect how people... So if you look at... at uh, uh, and I'm just going to say it right now, I'm a big fan of former Mayor Bloomberg. You look at some of the things that he did, including you know, getting smoking out of a lot of places in New York City, getting bike lanes in place for people to start moving around, starting to talk about restricting different kinds of uh, foods, uh, kind of big sugary foods as part of the thing. I think that makes a ton of sense from this equation of what are some things to start uh, thinking about. Particularly because the following thing. If you are inactive in your 60s, in this red line on the left, you have a higher chance of dying than if you're very active in your mid-80s. Pretty impressive. And start thinking about that also for the treatment of disease as well. So, you know, basically the important thing about all this is that we want people to basically be active and we want to keep them out of this in our healthcare system, keep them out of this kind of end zone where, you know, they're having a really tough time. We want to keep them active until the last, I had an 82-year-old lady ran the marathon this year. Um, and I think goal setting is a big piece of that, um, as well as some of the stuff um, you know, to think about in terms of you know, what you want to do. And the goal is to basically die young as, as late as possible. I made the comment before about fitness versus fatness. And again, I would much rather you be overweight and active than skinny and inactive. The benefits of health and exercise kick in not with your body uh, shape or size. It has to do with what you're doing. And so it's better to be fat and fit than skinny and unfit. Low levels of fitness is a much bigger risk factor um, than it is activity. So it's what you're doing that becomes the key thing. And you're going to be hearing a lot more of this coming up in the next five years or so, something called interleukin-6. So interleukins basically tell cells what to do. They're kind of like the quarterbacks of telling different cells what to do. Interleukin-6 is made in two places. It's made in your muscles and it's made in your fats. If you're sitting around not doing anything, your fat makes IL-6, which is pro-inflammatory. So pretty much every chronic disease we see, asthma, arthritis, uh, you name it, most every chronic disease is affected by levels of circulating inflammation. And when you're making this fat IL-6, it's a pro-inflammatory. So you basically get this increased levels of um, different markers of general body inflammation. When IL-6 is made by muscle, it has the exact opposite effect. It basically is completely anti-inflammatory. So the idea here is that chronic disease is basically prevented and treated with uh, higher circulating IL-6 from muscle. Um, and so we're just kind of discovering this and applying this. That's why things like you know, colon cancer or things that don't, may, might, may, might not make a lot of sense, why would I exercise and that would help that? And I think there's a lot of chronic disease models that are gonna be affected by this concept of IL-6 as we go forth. You'll hear more about this in the years to come. But it's a super interesting, I think, field that we're kind of just recognizing the benefits of this beyond the scope of our, it just makes me feel good. All right, so by this point uh, of my talk, you're like, all right, dude, I got it. Exercise is good for me. That's why I'm here. That's why I came to hear you in the first place. I got it. All right, good. So now the question is, how do I put this into my life? I get it. I should do it. How do I do it? And how do I make my parents who are home in Indiana do it? Because I'm doing it here in New York City, but they're home and they're like, you know, sitting around watching TV every night. How do they do it? And so that's where we're going to talk about next. So basically... What I did in the second half of Exercise Cure is to divide up uh, fitness levels into bronze, silver, and gold, meaning inactive, moderately active, and very active. And here are some formulas for all those guys. So my bronze level guys are people who don't do anything. Show of hands, who here has a fuel belt or a jawbone or something like that on their wrist or person? One, two, three, four, five, six of you guys? I think that's been really great. I think it helps keep people honest. I don't know if you've had that experience, but all of a sudden, like, all right, I took this number of steps today, I gotta do more. 
or I took this number of steps today, I got to do more. And I think that's been really great for my bronze guys in trying to give you a goal and a social network that, listen, all right, my sister in Toledo, she took this amount of steps. I want to keep up with her. And that's been very helpful, and I think we'll see more of that as we go forth. I want you to think about something which you guys do great at Google. You guys still have the scooters here and everything? Yeah. All right. So what you guys do here at Google is you're actively increasing your NEAT profile. What's that? Non-exercise active thermogenesis, or just burning calories from cruising around. <laughs> Every time you scooter up and down and go up and down the pole, that you guys got that pole thing, the slide thing? Everything's, is that still here? All right, cool. You do that kind of stuff. You're increasing your NEAT profile. And as you do that, you're just basically burning calories. What that does is think about that first slide I showed you from that journal circulation. You're reducing your risk of chronic disease. I think of it this way, that basically we had this huge public health campaign against smoking because smoking was correlated to all kinds of things, heart disease, diabetes, certain types of cancer. Sitting is the new smoking, all right? Straight up, sitting is the new smoking. Inactivity and the health problems from inactivity are almost identical to the health problems from smoking, which is why I want to get going on you know, public health campaigns to encourage activity much in the way we use those same things to kind of get rid of many of the smokers we used to see because it's, the, the profiles are almost identical. Silver workouters, we have to start thinking about increasing your kinetic chain. And then golds are the guys who are going to come to class on Sunday. And I'll talk about some of the stuff you can do online on your own at home to start building your gold profile. All right, so what's our current system doing? You know, some healthcare companies, some, some companies give you a discount if you join a gym. That's great, but all right, so you join a gym. Does that mean you're going to go? I don't know. Um, so the truth is less than 5% of Americans are active. There was a big study published of, of 11 different studies, 2012, 2013. Motivation came through incentives. If we incentivize people to move, they moved. This is the best study I'm going to show you in this talk. This guy published in JAMA, and he's got a dual appointment at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. He's at Wharton and at the medical school. And his whole thing is looking at financial models to incentivize behavior. And he took 56 guys who were very overweight. Now, they were between the ages of 40 and 60. The truth is, if you want to get either gender to change what they're doing, try getting like a guy to change his behavior. Like, good luck. All right, so baseline, it's tough to get guys to change their behavior. Fair? Fair. Now, in that, we have these guys that have these really unhealthy healthcare behaviors for a long time. They're very sedentary. And what he did is he set up a model where basically everybody got the same intake information, diet, and exercise. Now in that, one group just got that. They were weighed every week for 16 weeks, uh, and that's all they got. One group was said, listen, if you lose a pound a week for 16 weeks, we're going to give you $5 a week. And one group said, you're going to come in, we're going to weigh you once a week, and you get a scratch off, like a lottery. And if you basically are at your target weight, if you lost a pound a week, then you win what's underneath it. It was everything from five to fifty dollars. So some week you do good, some week you do bad. At the end of four months, the guys that got the information but didn't get anything else, they were just weighed exactly the same weight. Both of the financial models lost on average about 17 pounds and everybody made their target goal. Now the average diabetic who's on diabetes, uh, who has diabetes because they're overweight and takes insulin, costs about $350 per month on medicine. Uh, these guys were paid out an average of $250 over a four-month period of time. It doesn't take much money. It just takes a little incentive structure. So different companies are doing different things, everything from using some of your Fitbits. If you join Humana Insurance, they have this vitality program where you can sign up for the vitality program and you get a Fitbit. Then they calculate what's called your vitality score and your vitality age. So you're 35 and your healthcare behavior is such that you may be only 31 or you may be 40. And they calculate how many steps do you need per day and per week. And if you meet your target goals, you pay a little bit less in your health insurance premium. Because why should you pay more than somebody else who's really inactive? It doesn't make any sense. Plus, it'll incentivize you to do more. So I think there's a lot we're going to be seeing in this space to encourage people to do the right thing. And we do it already. I mean, why do people buy houses? And why do people uh, you know, do all kinds of things? We incentivize marriage and having kids and uh, going into debt in some way. So our system already incentivizes all these behaviors. We're spending so much money on this problem, we should be incentivizing activity and wellness. And so uh, that's, I think, what that is. So with you, your baseline note for you and for your parents is I need 150 minutes a week of exercise, all right? Everything beyond that's gravy. 
30 minutes a day, 150 minutes a week, that's what we need. And so let's talk about our bronze guys. Our bronze guys are guys who are sitting around. We want them to increase their NEAT profile, meaning we want them to just burn more calories throughout the day. As we get to our silvers, um, we start thinking about now increasing their strength in their cardio. So as I get to my silvers, I start thinking about increasing uh, what's called uh, your kinetic chain. If you're active here, uh, or if you've been to see me at some point or been to my classes, you hopefully woke up this morning and said, I love my kinetic chain. If you didn't, think about it now. I love my kinetic chain. All right, that sounds good, dude, but what's the kinetic chain? The kinetic chain is how all the muscles are connected in the body tip to toe. And for a kinetic chain to work, it needs to be flexible and it needs to be strong. So if you come in to see me with like an achy knee or an achy shin or an achy hamstring, what I'm gonna tell you is, or a herniated disc in your back or whatever it is, I can't fix your anatomy. If you have some arthritis in your knee, you do. If you have a herniated disc, you do. But if you make your kinetic chain more effective through strength training and flexibility, those things are gonna feel a ton better. So number one, flexibility. Huge fan. Who here owns a foam roller? Good, all right, so hopefully not only do you own it, but you're using it, um, which is the other part about having it. Uh, sometimes people just have it, um, and it's like a closed stand in the corner. And so uh, what I'd say is that you know, using this roller is hugely valuable. In both this book and in the uh, Home Remedies book, I have a full foam roller workout to do, and you can kind of see that in there, what to do with your roller, so it's not just sitting in the corner. I say every day, but realistically three times a week for about 15 minutes, it will really help your flexibility. The other piece is strength. So these functional strength training classes are a blast. If your eye whatever device is close to you, if you just yank it out and text in the number 22828 and put in the one word iron strength, you will automatically be signed up to be on our strength training list. And by that, you'll get emails every couple weeks uh, talking about our different classes. Um, I'll leave this up for a second if anybody wants to register for that. And it will automatically sign you up um, and you'll be part of our class list. Uh, these classes are always free. Every fourth class, we do a fundraiser for a different nonprofit. So for example, this Sunday, we're doing a fundraiser for a great uh, uh, nonprofit called Girls on the Run, which takes at-risk girls and teaches them about running and running programs to help them uh, kind of build self-esteem and good health behaviors. So we try and do a different nonprofit uh, every couple months, but they're a ton of fun. We do them in the winter, mostly indoors at Equinox at Rock Center. In the summer, we do them all over the place. I usually do a couple down here on Pier 25, right near you guys, like basically across the street. <laughs> Um, after work in the summer. Um, we're gonna do one this summer on Governor's Island, which will be a lot of fun. And I'm gonna throw this out there right now, but I definitely would be psyched, if you guys would be psyched, I would come down here like one morning and be like a 7 a.m. on the terrace workout and kick some Google butt if you guys wanna do that. If there's interest, yes, we'll do that. So we'll set it up this summer. We'll try an iron strength workout this summer down here. Um, if you can pop open the ice cream truck after the workout, that'd be great. Um, and, uh, but that'll be great, but that'd be a lot. So these are really fun ways. if you live wherever and you want to try this online, if you just go to runnersworld.com and just put in my name or Iron Strength, you'll find this streaming video. It's free and you can try this stuff at home. Now finally, we're at our golds and those are our advanced guys. So those are the guys who are doing plyometrics and a plyometric is a very rapid elongation contraction cycle of the muscle. You know, Iron Strength is a very plyometric based workout and I think you can really train that stuff at home. I'll, you know, that's what our class is all about. And basically people have different distributions of um, slow and fast switch fibers in their genetic anatomy. That's why some people are naturally faster than others. But even within that, you can do a lot with yourself with plyometric based strengthening. You can really make you a much better athletic version of you um, with that. So in conclusion, I would just say that, um, you know, I hope that, uh, you know, this message of uh, exercise as medicine is one that, uh, that resonates. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you at uh, one of my classes soon. Maybe I'll see you here when we do a boot camp up here. Uh, and I hope you kind of think about this message uh, and kind of push it forth in whatever way you have. I just think this is, to me, this is the fundamental, oh, that's, uh, that's fine, that's, just, that's the last one, that's this one, but just resources that I hope help keep people thinking about this dialogue of you know, getting people out and moving and active um, because I would much rather think about preventing disease rather than spending all these billions of dollars paying for the treatment of disease. Happy to answer any questions uh, in the room. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming. This is sure. really fun. Um, so you talked a little bit about neat profiles and the things Google does to help us raise them. Um, one of the cool things we have are standing desks. And when I try to stand all day long, it's really exhausting. So what would you put as like a benchmark for using that? And I have a second question. 
which is in your book I was flipping through it and you said something about exercising seven days a week which is a lot. Um, I usually find that by day six, I'm like pretty tired and sore. So what sort of exercises would you recommend doing over those seven days so that we're still energized to keep going on day eight? Great, so two good questions. I'll answer the second one first. So exercising seven days a week, I'm a big fan of, but it doesn't mean you have to do the same intensity or a thing or even close. So um, you know, whatever it is, if it's gentle stretching, a swim, a yoga class, or maybe nothing, um, but I, I think basically doing something Daily just helps for a number of different reasons. Not only, I mean, obviously, you don't need the reinforcement because your lifestyle behavior is already deeply entrenched with exercise. Um, but I think doing something every day, I think physiologically, mentally, um, is, is most helpful for most people. But it doesn't have to be the same intensity for sure not. Um, incidentally, we did our office outing last, um, uh, last night. We did a hot yoga class. Uh, last night, I was like, dude, we're not doing this again. But anyway, but it was good. <laughs> no, it was pretty good. I'm kidding. Um, but uh, so that was good. And then the standing desk issue um, is when I love those things if you like them. Now, it requires much like training for a marathon. Your marathon wouldn't be your first race. And so doing a full day of standing probably shouldn't be your first exposure to a standing desk. So to go from a seated desk to a full standing desk is like kind of going from running a 5K to running the marathon without kind of taking the 10K and half marathon steps in between. So I think trying things like at our office, we have those little ball seats where people sit on a ball as an intermediary step to getting to a standing desk or doing you know, lots of planks and building up to it. You know, but I wouldn't go whole hog. if you're. I would kind of try and build up to it over time uh, and, and see how that goes if that's, if that's a possibility. But if it's still bugging you, I think building your core strength through a lot of planks and stuff will help you be able to do it for long. And I like those desks if you like them. There's also a treadmill desk too. Do you guys have those here? Yeah, yep. yeah that's pretty cool. Hi, thank you. I had a, a quick question. So you talked about 150 minutes a week. Unfortunately, I'm a little bit of a um, weekend warrior. And I do a um, like a competitive race class on a spin bike where they, where they capture your heart rate. Mm -hmm. And I find that my heart rate is often for prolonged periods of time above 100%, like well into the red. Um, and then it's impossible to recover for the rest of the day. Is it because you should not be exercising at that intensity for so long? Or is it like, are there other things that you can do so that you can, like, I can sustain it, but Len, I'm, in, I'm a disaster. So it's a great me. physiology question. So what you're telling me, though you don't know what you're telling me, is you're finding your lactate threshold. So let me kind of give you two terms. One is called VO2 max. And so VO2 max is the maximum amount of oxygen you can take out of your blood. Um, and so that's why if you're like at a race and there's like some woman ahead of you, you're like, I want to catch her, but I just can't catch her. Um, and every race she's like ahead of you by whatever, you know, she physiologically probably has a better VO2 max. Uh, that's how much in basically the more oxygen you take and the more ATP you can use, the better your muscle will work. And that tends to be genetic more than anything, which is what I always say is that you can marry whoever you want, but if you want to have fast progeny, you should reproduce with somebody who's got a high VO2 max is my general comment. <laughs> Now, that being said, that's a joke. All right, now, um, uh, the, the key that you're not recognizing is called your lactate threshold. So lactate threshold is the level where lactic acid builds up and starts to basically make muscles acidic and not work very well and unpleasant to do stuff. Yeah. Lactate threshold is hugely trainable. VO2 max is not lactate threshold. Is. So you can go for longer periods of time and not feel like you just got shot the rest of the day. Yeah. If you train your lactate, so how do I do that? And that is interval training. So the stuff like in iron strength, you should do my workout on your phone twice a week for a half hour at home. If you start meeting our good friend, Lord Admiral Burpee from the British Navy. Um, so burpees are great because they start building cardiovascular strength. They start pushing that interval training, builds, pushes that lactate threshold, and then your weekend won't kill you as bad. So there's a lot of ways to make that better so you, you don't have to stop doing that. Okay. All right? Thank you. Sure. So it's not a marathon, but Emily knows I'm going to this uh, re hiking retreat in a month. Cool. And I haven't worked out regularly in about a year for various reasons, mostly just New York. And so I've got a month to get in shape to hike every day up to like 17 miles in the last day with two yoga classes a day plus some sort of like bar class. What should I do as like a pretty like not even bronze. I say I'm like a copper. Okay. List in the next four weeks. Well, first of all, come get my card. No, uh, so, uh, no. So you have a month, and your month needs to focus on building strength. Are you like an established hiker, or this is like a, you're a new I hiker? I used to be. I used to live in Northern California. Gotcha. So it's been hard here. All right. Yeah. 
it can be done, but not right, fair enough. So, you know, you have to think about number one, building some strength. So you have a month, you can definitely make great strength gains in a month. And I would start doing some of the stuff, you know, do the, some of the online strengthening stuff. It'll be great for you. Start building some baseline strength. That will help. You have a foam roller? Yes. Okay. So if you have, if you have a small one, you can bring to California. Is that where you're hiking? Uh, I am, yeah. Uh, so bring, bring your roller with you because every day when you get back, I want you to make sure you roll. Um, number, so building strength and increasing your flexibility will help your kinetic chain work better. Um, and then, you know, there's some sports specific things. So we don't have a lot of great hiking super close here, but we do, you know, pretty easy to get away to, but we got a lot of stairs. You know, so we have a lot of buildings, a lot of big stairs, and that can really help for like hikers, particularly mountain climbers that want to build those particular glute muscles and all that. So a combination of, you know, stair climbing, plyometric strengthening online, rolling, that will definitely help make a big dent. And you'll, you can go from copper, you know, you can get you up to silver, I bet, in a month. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Hi, Dr. Metzl. Hi. Um, so talking about uh, the bronze cop no silver yeah I, never, <laughs> I, I like copper that was good yeah levels and this is a kind of a running specific question with regard to the your easy days your normal running days however long you run just at a moderate to easy mm -hmm. effort where does that fall in your mind in that standing and you mentioned how like with each day i guess you want to hit at least silver or gold for 25 percent of that portion so would that involve running your easy runs either yeah the portion of it being picked up, et cetera? That's a good question. So it kind of depends on what level you're at, but if there, are, there is such a thing as just a straight recovery day, a recovery run, and those, I think you just kind of do a straight recovery run independent of the other stuff. I'm kind of speaking on, in the workout structure more just when you're actually doing a pretty active heart. If it's just a slight recovery thing in your kind of how you're training, and obviously you're more advanced to, to ask that question, um, I think your recovery run should still just be recovery if you're doing that kind of stuff. But I don't love recovery run isn't for everybody. I think like recovery swim or recovery yoga class or whatever um, is great too. So I wouldn't be fully locked into the, in, you know, straight recovery. And then the other comment I would make for you is runners are my most delinquent strength trainers in general. I don't know if you fall in that category or not, but I hope not. I not. Um, what? I try not to. Okay, good. Um, but, you know, runners tend to think oh, I'm running, so I don't need to, in fact, since you're running, you need to really do more to build that kinetic chain strength. All right. Uh, so I actually had two questions. Um, the first one is, so um, I'm probably a little atypical for Googlers. I probably have a few more miles on me than the average Googler. <laughs> so, um, and you know, with that comes assorted injuries that you accumulate over time. So I was just wondering in terms of um, just as a general matter in, in strength conditioning, do you, do you think it's advisable to sort of target the areas where you've had problems in the past, or is it just more of a sort of overall mm -hmm. conditioning thing? And my second question is, you didn't talk much about sleep, and I'm just wondering sort of how sleep figures into the dynamic because great thing. sometimes Two the good questions. is either exercise yeah. or sleep. So. Two great questions. Um, so, you know, the workout stuff I talk about and teach is all about what's called kinetic chain strengthening. So it's kind of strengthening a chain is only as strong as its weakness. So if you have a little bit of arthritis in your knee, by making that whole chain stronger, it puts less load on the knee. There also are some injury specific things. I'm actually working on my next book now with, with, uh, with Runner's World, which is another Rodale thing. And I've done a whole series of like 20 of these videos called Inside the Doctor's Office, where you can kind of click on your iPhone and watch the video in combination with the paperback. It's gonna be really cool, I think. Um, in that, I have a whole thing on sleep and the importance of sleep. Uh, and it's a fine line between, am I sleeping enough for me? And do I skip the workout and sleep? And it can be a day-to-day -day decision, you know, so, uh, and I don't have an exact number for you. It depends on, you know, how you're feeling and what you've done. So I think basically you got to listen to your own body. And if, you know, I would rather sleep than do a bad workout, but I tend to function a lot better if I do something. So I think it's a very individual thing. There's not an absolute number I can give you that, but it's certainly something to think about and definitely in terms of performance as well. All right, I'm happy to sign any books you guys have. Thank you so much for having me and I'll see you soon in class. Bye-bye.